Hey guys, this is Nick and here are some Linux, open source and privacy news for August 2020. This month we have troubles at Mozilla, Lenovo putting their Linux machines front and center and Firefox 80 finally bringing hardware acceleration to VDU on Linux. Ok, let's start with the Linux news. The Linux kernel version 5.8 was released with plenty of changes for AMD users. The energy driver for Zen and Zen 2 sensors is now implemented. So Ryzen users can now more closely monitor energy consumption and temperature for their CPUs. The Adreno 405, 640 and 650 GPUs now have open source support, the XFAT driver has been improved and ARM devices can now support Thunderbolt. It is also now possible to swap the function and control keys on Apple keyboards. KDE Neon rebased on Ubuntu 20.04 to bring a more modern base and better hardware support to the distro. All libraries and the kernel will have been updated and you can upgrade in place directly from the package manager if you haven't already. There will be a virtual Linux app summit in November 2020. This convention allows developers from the various desktop environments to get together and try to work on and improve interoperability between their various applications as well as proposing and implementing new standards. This edition will be virtual thanks to COVID-19 and will take place in November. Sponsors are welcome to help the project happen. Now on to the open source news. The Linux Foundation started the Open Source Security Foundation or OSSF. It regroups efforts from multiple companies already engaged in various security initiatives like GitHub, GitLab, Google, IBM, Microsoft, Red Hat or VMware. The goals are to help identify threats to open source projects, improve tooling for security, implement a set of best practices and handle vulnerability disclosure. Geoffrey Knoth has been nominated as the new president for the Free Software Foundation, a year after Richard Stallman was forced to resign. He was already the treasurer for the FSF, so I guess this makes sense and maybe will give a more amenable presence to the Free Software Foundation. Mozilla laid off 250 people in an attempt to focus on more profitable products and restructure the foundation. This won't affect Firefox, Mozilla's flagship, but will severely reduce the number of products they focus on. Offices in Taiwan will also be closed. Mozilla is the major actor in the defense of the open web and Firefox is crucial for that, so let's hope this won't be in vain and Mozilla will be able to recover. Microsoft launched a website to showcase its open source efforts. It contains around 25 projects, from major ones like .NET or VS Code to smaller ones like the Windows Terminal. It feels like Microsoft really wants to put the focus on its open source efforts and maybe regain a little bit of credibility with that. Google is proposing a web bundle standard which will basically prevent resources from being accessed individually through a URL and only give access to a full bundle. This is obviously a terrible move from the open web and reinforces the fact that letting Google decide on how the web works by controlling Chromium and Blink, the basis for more than three quarters of web browsers, is a very, very bad idea. Now we move on to the applications. Pinta's development has started again after a five year pause. For those not familiar with it, it's basically a clone of paint.net, but available on Linux. It's nice to see development resume on this tool since it's a good compromise between a very simple paint-like app and a more featureful but complex GIMP. It's also shipped as a snap, which might ruffle some feathers. Firefox 79 also has enhanced tracking protection and clears redirect cookies every 24 hours. This feature wasn't made explicitly clear in the browser's release notes, but has been announced a bit later, and it's a great addition to limit how advertisers can track you around the web. LibreOffice 7 was released with better Microsoft Office compatibility, a new icon theme, which is the default on macOS, a bunch of new shapes in the gallery, new effects for objects to improve the aesthetics of documents, and a whole new graphics engine for more performance. Each app also received a lot of improvements, so update now if you haven't already. 1Password has launched its first preview of an official Linux app. This password manager isn't free, but it's one of the most featureful out there. It's a native application as well, which is nice. The app is still in preview, but you can already use it if you want. CadenLive 20.08 was released with layout support. The new version brings performance improvements, but also some predefined layouts which make use of the highly customizable interface of the editor to present layouts dedicated to tagging footage, editing, color grading, adding effects and editing audio. It's a great new release which just lacks hardware acceleration to become my video editor of choice again. Ubisoft renewed their funding of Blender and it seems the company is heavily investing in the project to develop their own custom tools and open source add-ons for Blender. It's great to see open source software get funding from big companies which probably profit from having a world-class tool without hefty license fees. Firefox 80 was released with optional hardware acceleration for video decoding on Linux. 
This feature was solely needed to improve battery life and video playback performance. You'll have to enable it in the About config page as it's still experimental, but I'd expect it to become the default soon since my experience with it has been flawless. Now let's move on to hardware and drivers. The System76 team is teasing its new keyboard again. It seems it will work with their auto tiling feature, sport mechanical keys, and a reimagined layout with a shorter spacebar to let other functions be more readily accessible. This keyboard has no release date yet, but I'm curious to see what they come up with. Nvidia will probably become more interesting for people who want to use Wayland, as they propose a change in Mesa to help support Accelerated X Wayland, which lets Wayland users run X-dependent applications, like most games for example. We still have to see if the Mesa project accepts that change or not though. Tuxedo Computers released the Tuxedo Pulse 14, a smaller version of the Tuxedo Pulse 15 they had already released last month. This full AMD laptop seems to be using the same chassis and specs as the Slimbook KDE, and it looks like a fantastic machine for the price. Lenovo put its Linux running laptops front and center on its website, as the first option proposed is now indicated as with Linux. There is no specific mention of Fedora, but I think that's probably for the best, as a normal buyer might have heard of Linux, but not of Fedora specifically. Let's hope other computer manufacturers will take note and showcase their Linux-powered machines as well. Take the hint, Dell. The Pine64 announced the new community edition of the Pine phone, and this time it's Manjaro branded. The phone will ship with Manjaro, obviously, which will be able to run Lumiri, which is Ubuntu Touch, Fosh or Plasma Mobile, and sports a Manjaro logo on the back. It starts at $149 for the base version, and $199 for the Conversions edition, which sports more RAM and storage to ensure you can use it as a desktop if you want to. And let's complete this video with the gaming news. Vulkan, the graphics API, is getting extensions specifically meant to allow for translation layers compatibility. These extensions exist in other graphics APIs and are stated as useful for building translation layers or for porting apps. I love to see these mainstream APIs implementing stuff specifically to help make gaming on Linux more viable. The XVK 1.7.1 was released, making GeForce Now usable thanks to some missing shader instructions being implemented, and fixing bugs for Metro Exodus, Resident Evil 7, Trackmania, Darksiders, Monster Hunter World, Borderlands 3, Halo and Halo CE, or even Mafia 3 Definitive Edition. As previously announced, GeForce Now now runs on Linux, and you can already install the app using Lutris, or run it in a browser with a bit of user agent spoofing, which is super easy to do. The website Gaming on Linux has all the details, and although Nvidia didn't release an official app for Linux, it's still good to be able to run any service that we want on our platform. Wine 5.15 was released with the initial implementation of the X-Act engine libraries and 27 bug fixes, including for Bully Scholarship Edition, Call of Duty World War II, Grim Dawn, or Red Dead Redemption 2. And Wine 5.16 was also released this month with 21 bug fixes, including for Quake Champions, Tomb Raider 1, Magic the Gathering Arena, Abzu, but also Firefox, because yes, Wine is also used for other stuff than gaming, even though running a Windows version of Firefox on Linux through Wine doesn't really make sense to me. And that's it for August. I hope you guys enjoyed the video. If you did, don't hesitate to like, subscribe, and turn on notifications. You can also check out my Linux gaming channel using the link in the description, or subscribe on Patreon or join the YouTube channel. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!